One of the ways that illustrates Jesus' salvation of his people is to call them his family, his house, Hebrews 3, verse 6, the fundamental structure of any human civilization. Could that help us understand the connection to Jesus being the Son of Man? Good morning and welcome to the Bible Study Pal podcast. My name is Greg Circle, the preacher for the Church of Christ that meets in Palmyra, Indiana. On today's episode, we continue our deep dive into the Gospel according to Mark, our book of the month for January of 2023. Let's get into the study. Mark chapter 3, verses 7 through 12. Whose house are we? To begin this episode of the podcast, we consider all of the various cultures that are represented in the crowds seeking to be near Jesus. We might not think of people from the extremes of a place the size of Indiana to have different cultures, but consider the differences you find between the citizens of Lake County near Chicago and those of Floyd County near Louisville. Contrast the people of Elkhart with those of Evansville. What are the political differences, religious differences, demographic differences? Now, admittedly, being a transplant, I'm not an expert on Indiana. Maybe there's not as great a difference as I believe. But I can tell you of the differences you'll encounter simply crossing certain county lines in West Virginia. And that's nothing compared to moving from Mercer County to Marshall County, going from Yall to Ewens. So there can be a large variation between people in a small area. Consider also that it takes upward of four hours to travel from New Albany to Gary. By foot, it would take four days. Can we imagine the differences that might be magnified by that distance? We can still communicate with V'ger more quickly than that. If you think about the proper names in verses 7 and 8, you can begin to see the appeal of Jesus not just to the Jews, but even to the Gentiles. Now, Galilee makes sense because that's where Jesus has spent his time so far, aside from his trip down south to see cousin John in the beginning of the gospel. They came from Judea and Jerusalem, also Jewish and probably more so. Idumea? Oh, that's interesting. That was Edom. Herod the Great was born there. They had some relationship with the Jews. They shared a common ancestry, but there was some heavy political baggage there. Beyond the Jordan? Yeah, lots of Gentiles. Tyre and Sidon? Well, that's where Jesus traded jabs with the Syrophoenician woman. Interestingly, there is one area that's kind of missing. Where are the Samaritans? Maybe everyone who was pressing in on Jesus was, in fact, Jewish, but they at least had various other influences that added variety to the crowd. It was not homogeneous. So a large, multicultural crowd was following Jesus and pushing him toward and almost into the Sea of Galilee. As we discussed in the last episode, Jesus' goal was to teach. If he could get away from the crowd just a little bit, if he could get some distance, he could speak to them. He commanded his disciples to have a boat ready. The boat may have been the best way to do it. Of course, he still had compassion on them, and he healed them of the various diseases and ailments, including possession by unclean spirits. And as in previous episodes, quote, he earnestly warned them not to tell who he was. Mark chapter 3, verses 13 through 19. Whose house we are. Here we find Jesus choosing the twelve apostles. The twelve apostles are important because they became the ones to be given the responsibility of teaching the first century church. They would be the ones given the Holy Spirit, so they would be taught and reminded of all things that Jesus would say, John 14, 26. So their testimony would be corroborated, John 15, 26 and 27. And so the world would be convicted of sin, righteousness, and judgment, John 16, verse 8. They would also be the only ones who would be able to pass on the Holy Spirit to operate in the same way in other early Christians. Saul of Tarsus would be added to this group as, quote, one untimely born, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 8. But in this list of names, a couple of things stand out. First, there are some name changes. Simon was given the name Peter, the one who was to be heard. The meaning of the name Simon was given the name Rock. The sons of Zebedee were called the sons of thunder. The tax collector, Levi who was attached to his job, became Matthew, a gift of Yahweh. For something so common as a name, they sure do garner a lot of interest and thought. When a family is expecting a new child, they spend so much time pondering names. Do the names sound good together in tone and meter? Will her initials spell something inappropriate? How will his peers modify his name to poke fun at him? But most importantly, what does the name mean? That may be a bigger deal in some cultures than others. I've been told of preachers visiting India who were honored 
by the brethren there to name a newborn child. And when they ask them to do that, when they request that, they always ask for the meaning of the name as well. We see name changes throughout both Testaments of the Bible. Names could change for a few reasons. The new name could emphasize an important part of the person's character. Perhaps the person needs an alias because they need to make a clean break from their former life. Another thing that's interesting about this part of the story is the number of apostles. Twelve. That's the same number as the tribes of Israel, the same number as the sons of Israel, keeping in mind that Jesus is the Son of Man. And we're trying to focus on what that means. Jesus may be trying to show that he is setting up a new civilization, a new nation, a new culture, a new religion, a new family, a new household. He was laying the foundation for a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. This is his house. Mark chapter 3, verses 20 through 32 whose house is divided. We're going to split this section into a couple of smaller portions because this is really the meat of this part of Mark. We're first going to talk about verses 20 through 22, sort of an introduction, if you will, of what Mark was going to talk about, perhaps even what Mark has been talking about this whole chapter. Mark tells us about three groups of people all vying for Jesus' attention, the crowd who wants to be healed, his family who want to protect him, and the scribes who want him to stop teaching against their traditions. We read about the crowd at the beginning of the episode, and if it has dwindled, it hasn't dwindled enough. Jesus and the apostles couldn't even get a bite to eat. Here we read about his kinsmen who think he has gone crazy, and the scribes who think he's lying about the source of his authority. He casts out demons by the ruler of the demons, they say. Verses 23 through 27, the parables. Here in Indiana, we have IU and Purdue. If a family has children in both of these fine institutions, they will usually boast with a placard on the front or perhaps a bumper sticker on the back of their vehicle that is half black and gold and half crimson and cream. Kentucky has U of L and UK. West Virginia has the green and white of Marshall and the blue and gold of the University of Southern Pittsburgh. I mean, West Virginia University. We call these houses with children in opposing universities divided this is, of course, little more than a marketing scheme to sell humorous merchandise. But the point is that there is some sort of rivalry between each of these pairs of schools. It usually involves sports, or perhaps it's merely out of pride. But when these institutions share a common goal, and they often do, they can and will work together and share in the praise of the accomplishment. One of the institutions will not, or at least they shouldn't, cast the other out. They're working together. What Jesus is describing is the error of the scribes in thinking that Jesus is working with Beelzebul and casting out demons by his authority. Jesus shows that Satan, the authoritarian, the adversary, the accuser, in their mind would be accusing himself, charging himself with a crime, voting himself out of power. Well, that's no way to be a king. And that's not how Satan works. Jesus asked, how can Satan cast out Satan? One of the things that you may notice about Jesus casting out demons is that they never leave willingly. They always seem to fight. Those whom the unclean spirits cast into convulsions to the ground and into the fires were hit with a parting shot. In a case we'll talk about later, the demons parlayed for the ability to enter a nearby herd of swine. And either way, they caused pain as they left. Sin does that sometimes, doesn't it? It doesn't want to let go of us. Or perhaps in that case, we don't want to let go of it. When something has ruled someone for so long, it's difficult for them to see how one can get along without having that authority in their life. It offered them some semblance of innocence. It's not my fault. The devil made me do it. But of whose house are they? Who is their father? Who is the one with authority over them? Jesus came to lead captive a host of captives, Ephesians 4 and verse 8. How could he do that before he bound the strong man, the one who had taken them captive in the first place? He had to bind that strong man. With what would he bind him? The very thing the strong man used to bind those Jesus came to free, the judgment against rebellion. Verses 28 and 29, the lesson. The scribes and Pharisees looked at what was happening and accused Jesus of working against God. While they argued against Jesus' teaching, if it were only that, it could be attributed to their needing more time to look into it. They were still being held captive by their sin. They had time to reason through the righteousness that was happening. 
but they had to be willing to look into it. And in order to do that, they would have to accept God's instruction, 2 Timothy 3.16. When they would do that, then they could be saved. But instead, they added to that. They said, We see what you have the power to do here, and we reject the evidence on the grounds of it being demonic. They said, The power of the Spirit that was in Jesus, the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit, was that of the adversary, of Satan. In their mind, Jesus was in rebellion, not them. They were speaking against the Holy Spirit. Why then would they accept His instruction? No instruction, no forgiveness. Verses 30 through 32, the conclusion. The structure of Mark's writing here is interesting. In verses 20 through 22, he mentions the crowd, then Jesus, quote, own people, unquote, then the scribes. In these verses, he completes the sandwich by reversing the order. The sandwich dresses up and contains the meat of the lesson, putting emphasis on the idea of the house, the kingdom that the Son of Man has come to establish. Jesus first deals with the scribes by teaching about the eternal sin they were committing by calling Jesus a liar. Next, he comes back to Jesus' mother and brothers who were afraid of what they thought was lunacy. And finally, Mark mentions the crowd who believes that those of Jesus' earthly house have authority to lord over him. Mark chapter 3, verses 33 through 35. Of whose house are you? Who are Jesus' mother and brothers? The physical connection of Jesus' family, as blessed as it may have been, did them no good unless they were unified in their relationship through the Word of God. Luke chapter 11, verses 27 through 28. Jesus says that if you want to be a part of the family, the household of the Son of Man, you need to hear, observe, and do the will of God. Ye must be born again, again, ye must be born again, again, I verily, verily say unto thee, We invite you to join us as we worship our Lord and study His Word each Sunday morning at 9.15 a.m. for Bible classes for all ages, 10 a.m. and 5 p.m. for two distinct worship services, and each Wednesday evening at 6.30 p.m. for another chance to study and discuss God's Word. Occasionally, we may alter the p.m. service times for a special event. Please check palmyrachurchofchrist.org or our Facebook page for the schedule for the week. If you have any questions or would like to have a Bible study in person or by correspondence, email preacher at palmyrachurchofchrist.org or call 812-364-6215. Thank you for listening.